Good evening, everyone. I am very pleased to be able to welcome Aaron Betsky to Waterloo as our lecturer tonight. Uh, Aaron is a renowned architect, critic, museum director, curator, and educator who most recently was appointed as the new dean uh, of the Frank Lloyd Wright School of Architecture in Taliesin. Uh, from uh, 2006 to 2014, he was the director of the Cincinnati Art Museum. Previous to this, he was the director of the Netherlands Architecture Institute in Rotterdam. In addition uh, to being the curator of architecture, design, and digital projects at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. Aaron is also a critically important thinker. Uh, a provocateur, a prolific writer um, on architecture and design. He's completed numerous monographs, over a thousand articles, and 20 books in the last two and a half decades uh, on architectural experimentation and the work of late 20th century architects, uh, such as UN Studios, Zaha Hadid, MVRDV, Diller and Scafidio, as well as theoretic, the, theoretical texts on the relationship of architecture to aesthetics, culture, urbanism, landscape, psychology, uh, and queer space. As part of Aaron's very lengthy and substantial CV, he was also the director of the 11th exhibition of the International Venice Biennale in Architecture in 2008, and he will be curating the 2015 Shenzhen Urbanism and Architecture by City uh, Biennale. The theme of the Biennale is reliving the city that argues that the need to open up, reuse, and rethink the cities, buildings, and spaces that we already have uh, is a critical agenda. It will survey the best examples of tactical urbanism, showing how we can connect people and places through design using the Pearl River Delta to exemplify the potentials of ground up urbanism. In the context of, of the Biennale theme, his lecture tonight uh, called Hunting and Gathering, Tactical Urbanism, Collage, Architecture will survey the work of those who are currently reconceptualizing the human-made environment and who are hunting and gathering together uh, a better world. Please join me in welcoming Aaron Betsky. Thank you. Um, I'm very happy to be here, however cold it is, and I won't make any more jokes about that, I promise you. Uh, and thank you all for coming out. I understand that several of you um, have been up all night. If any of those of you who did that are here, uh, you have my permission to fall asleep uh, in the middle of the lecture. Uh, if more than half of you fall asleep, I'll know I need to speed it up. So it will be a good, good way to signal it. Thank you for that introduction. You make me sound much more impressive than I actually am. Uh, I'm not sure I actually ever did all of those things or am doing all of those things. Um, I think that the other way to um, describe what my life is, and I need to make one correction actually to your introduction, is that I'm a failed architect. Uh, I'm trained as an architect, but I cannot call myself an architect, so I have to be very careful to say that because uh, I don't laugh. I mean, I, I'm sure the Canadian, uh, what is it, the Canadian Institute of Architects? What's it called here? The Col Royal Institute. I'm sure they're much more reasonable, but in the United States, I've been threatened with lawsuits twice uh, because people have introduced me as an architect and I'm not. So I never got licensed. Um, so a lot of what I'm going to talk about and a lot of what I'm going to show you is in fact not what many people would think of as architecture. And that's because I think that there's a basic uh, problem in the way that we talk about architecture. And that is, I've, I thought this, when I came up with this idea, I thought this was just so simple I didn't even need to explain it. But I have found that it's probably the most baffling thing that I say. And also the only overarching theme in reality of a very diverse group of projects and images that I'm going to show you. And that simply is that architecture is not building. Building is an activity. It's building something. And a building is a building. We're sitting in a building. Architecture is everything that is about building. 
It's how we design buildings. It's how we talk about buildings. It's how we represent buildings. It is the meta of buildings, if you will. It is absolutely true that by that very definition, the very best way to make architecture is with a building. That's the most complete way to make a building. However, when you make a building, it's very difficult to find the architecture in the building. Where is the architecture in this building? Now, you all, students and faculty and hangers-ons and members of the community who love architecture, might be able to look around and say, well, there's that column there, and look at the way they cut that to reveal the column. There's something going on there that we might call architecture. And anyone who was not privy to the great rites, rituals, and mystic knowledge of architecture would just scratch their head and go, what the hell are you talking about? It's very difficult to find architecture in buildings, and it's getting more difficult. It's getting more difficult because buildings today are not designed by architects, at least not by architects in the kind of Howard Rourke model. And by the way, oh, I've already lost one. Wow. <laughs> See, if I can offend three more people, I'll get things thinned out to the few. Um, at least not architects in the kind of Howard Rourke model. And I was going to say, by the way, um, I'll tell you at the end a little bit about Tellies and, and, and what we're going to do there. Uh, and the first thing I, I want to do is make sure that everyone understands that Frank Lloyd Wright was not Howard Rourke. Uh, it's very important. Does everyone here know who Howard Rourke, fictional Howard Rourke was? If you don't, don't read the book, The Fountainhead. It will ruin you for life. Uh, anyhow, don't, even worse, don't watch the movie. Uh, anyhow, sorry, I'm taking too long at this, but just to point out that buildings are not designed by architects who give them this complete shape out of the genius of their mind and then fulfill it using the base materials of steel and stone and concrete. Buildings, as I'm sure, since this is a co-op school, you all know, are defined by codes, by life and safety codes, by building codes, by codes of behavior, codes of appropriateness, and of course, most important these days, by computer codes, and even more important, by financial codes. Financial codes which say that whoever is investing in the building, whoever is the person who is asking you to make the building, their ultimate goal, no matter what they tell you, is to invest as little resources as possible, whether it's money or other resources, and get that money out as quickly as possible. And anything that you do that looks, smells, or smacks of architecture will prevent them getting their money out. So architecture gets, as they put it so beautifully, value engineered away. Not only that, not only that, it gets worse, but <laughs> architecture is also bad, evil, amoral in most situations. And that comes from a very simple situation, and that is that it is those same people who have the resources who commission architecture. Architecture is not made by and for the people. It's made by and for the people who have the money and the power to commission architecture. And that means that architecture always has been, is, and always will be the built affirmation of the values, beliefs, and needs of whoever is the social, political, and economic elite, who decree grand schemes, have them translated into concrete forms, and then imprison all of us in these places to live, work, and play in a such a manner that they maintain social divisions, not consciously, but in a way that they maintain social divisions and also, by the way, are environmentally disastrous. So most buildings are the tomb of architecture. And in fact, though I'm hesitating to talk about this uh, here tonight with, a, with an expert here, um, uh, most, in fact, architecture started um, as a tomb, as a tomb building, as the embodiment, the uh, fixing in a place of power and wealth. 
and removing that power and wealth from everyday experience. So if architecture is, if buildings are the tomb of architecture, then what the hell are we to do? What should an architecture do, or what can it do, to make our world better? And I know that's a very vague term, but I think, I believe, that architecture should make our world better, physically. It should make it more sustainable, environmentally. It should make it more socially open, in such a way that it really promotes democracy and social interaction and mobility. And it should make it more beautiful, not unimportant. It should make our world, the human-made world, a joy to inhabit and not a prison to suffer. How can you do that? Well, what I have argued for a long time, but as I said, you have to take it with a grain of salt because I'm a failed architect, is that architecture must move beyond buildings. That in fact, we all know a lot of very powerful architecture, and I'm sure there are some of you sitting here today who went into architecture because you saw great architecture in Blade Runner or The Matrix, or maybe in some old television series with a great palace in it. We see great architecture all around us in movies and television and on our screens. We see great architecture in the kind of temporary spaces created by what are considered to be the lowest of the low designers in the field of design, which are interior designers. Not coincidentally, until very recently, and even still today, on the whole women or gay men and women, or gay men and women. Interior design is never taken seriously, but that's where there is so much more action and so much more possibility. We see great architecture in landscapes that weaves together our urban environments. Frank Lloyd Wright famously said, bad doctors bury their mistakes, bad architects just plant ivy. Well, that ivy is often a lot better than the buildings on which it, to which it clings. And, of course, we see great architecture in what people call art. And you'll see a lot of what you might call art and that you might dismiss it. And that is because everything in our culture that is beautiful or revelatory or shocking, that for which we don't have a category, but that amazes us in one way or the other and is useless, we call art. So that's what you might see a lot of. So for the last, I don't know, however long, uh, I have been looking around to try to find examples of architecture beyond building, of ways in which architecture can open our world up, can make it more sustainable, and can make it more beautiful. And what you'll see tonight is part of my just continual collecting the title refers to my own hunting and gathering as well. But the title also points to what I think is the fundamental tactic. If there's one um, sort of central belief that I would throw out there, if there is one kind of artificial opposition I would throw out, which, which I realize is ridiculous, but you have to have a good battle cry, is that what is bad and evil is the imposition of abstract form on what is seen as an abject and completely empty world that is somehow created that form out of the genius or brain of the one designer. And what is good is to think of architecture as gathering together what already exists, what we already know, what is already there, and rethinking it, reusing it, repositioning it, reimagining it. That is the kind of architecture that interests me. Let me try to tell you this story now a little bit differently and in a considerably more mixed up way, um, which is why one has images, which is to say that we've all learned for a long time that architecture is the play of pure forms in light. That it consists 
of these building blocks that have been honed down by tradition and the laws of physics to these abstract perfect forms that somehow are right in a fundamental way. But we also have come to realize that those forms are expensive, worn down by time, and not always appropriate for environment. And in fact, what we have done with those forms is to create a new kind of language. A language that consists of these basic building blocks of construction that are defined, as I said, not by genius but by code, that proliferate in ever more complex forms for no apparent reason other than that the architect in his or her guilty conscience has to define what they're doing, what they're doing as worthwhile, and the client needs to have something that distinguishes their structure. This is what we think of as architecture. Buildings that have been tortured beyond recognition in order to be not buildings. So you can also say that architecture is not building. It is not building. It is those things that aspire to be something absurdly other, something so bizarre, something mimicking forces so beyond the building that you will notice them and that they will justify the tremendous investment that it takes to create these cantilevers, these mountains, these rhomboids, and all these other strange shapes. The architects that are most successful today at making buildings are the ones who torture the buildings. I should have called this lecture 50 Shades of Grey in Architecture because, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sometimes you think of something and you shouldn't say it. <laughs> um, Guess I won't use that line again. Uh, <laughs> but they are architects who torture their forms continually. And I, I had a student who wrote a paper that said, whose title was, How, Why Bjark Ingels Will Save the World of Architecture. And he might very well, because it is people like Bjark Ingels who are the best masters of the whips and chains of architecture that manage to drag out a building something that looks, smells, and feels like architecture, something that goes beyond what the building needs to be. And of course, the grand master of all of them is Frank Gehry, who is now in his late phase, where the building is dissolving completely into these billowing clouds that hover over 50,000 square feet of plain white box, creating 250,000 square feet of architecture, of a tent, of something that indicates that there is a building there, that is about the building there, something that makes architecture into built form at tremendous cost of great beauty, but at tremendous cost and of questionable function. But this, ladies and gentlemen, this is the most important building being built today. Probably the most expensive building per square foot being built today, other than the homes of the billionaires who work in Silicon Valley. This is the Apple headquarters. Being designed, having been designed by Norman Foster, it is now under construction. The perfect circle, the omega of architecture, the loss of anything that looks like an office building, the perfection of Dilbert land into an endless raceway that goes around forever around this center of the cenotaph where no doubt Steve Jobs will be buried at some point <laughs> so that he can still control the Apple empire from where he lies. This is architecture at its most abstract, at its most grand, at its most tortured, at its most extreme. But this is what architecture is actually becoming. This is the Apple Store in Grand Central Station. Now, I'm sure you've all been to Apple Stores. They are amazing because they're not there. So 
Grand Central Station is already a very interesting building in the history of architecture because it's the moment when a very particular set of traditions developed for palaces of rulers first is translated into a public transportation hub, becomes opened up by glass, and then is completely dug out and through by not just trains and subways, but also by cars moving uh, across this building and through this building at upper levels, and whose floor levels become completely destabilized in order to control the massive amounts of people there. Here is architecture already falling apart. Here are the building blocks of architecture, those pure play forms falling apart around you, and then there's the Apple store within it, which isn't there. All there is are a couple of tables that they put out in the morning, on, on which in the morning they put out the objects we all desire, and you wander into this part of this overall building, and when you are within reach, you find one of these mystical purveyors of these goods, you hand over your credit card, or don't even do that, you will obviously just wave, wave your magic wand with its Apple Touch on it, they disappear into some unseen place and come out with your little bag and you walk out. There's no building here. There's only a complex intersection of technology centered around this object. And I just, this, this afternoon when I was looking at this, going, oh, I keep forgetting I need to really update. This is like an iPhone 2 or something like that. It's really, it's one of those. I have this image and I just need to photograph my own iPhone and put it in there. Anyhow, um, because of course this is what it's becoming. And this is the, the challenge that now is really, I believe, taking us over the brink in terms of the necessity of buildings in the world of architecture, because this is where our world resides, which is nowhere. My mother, who we were talking about earlier today, um, uh, a, one of the people that she admired most when, when she was teaching in Leiden is one of your professors, which is, uh, you should be honored to have him here. Um, she always believed that inside every one of those computers there was a little man doing all that work. And how do we know she was wrong? Because you never know what happens inside these infinitesimally thin objects. And you never can see how they're connected. We are powerless in the face, the shiny reflective face of all of that technology. And of course that is just a symptom of the fact that we are nowhere and everywhere at the same time. We live in a world in which everything has dissolved. Karl Marx predicted it more than 150 years ago, 100, well, but now it's 170 years ago, when he said that all, ad, all that solid melts into air, all fixed, fast, frozen relationships disappear. We live in a world of sprawl in which it is very difficult to find any kind of coherence. You know, I drove here this afternoon from Toronto through this completely featureless environment, and I'm not just saying this to diss Toronto because it is the same environment that I drove through in Shenzhen two weeks ago, that I drove through in Phoenix on Tuesday, that I grew up with in Los Angeles for 10 years. It is the sprawl that is everywhere, the sprawl that reaches from here to Timbuktu, the concatenation of human dwellings that is everywhere around the world and everywhere the same. This, to me, is the central problem of architecture. This disillusion of what it means to be at home in our modern world into these ticky-tacky homes that now have spread out into these cancerous metastases of the great American Jeffersonian grid that let us hide in air conditioning and warmth plugged into all of our devices but disconnected from everyone else that are no more than storage devices for ourselves, our goods, and our information that we move through every day at such a rate that this is our reality, that we move through according to not the landmarks or the patterns, the grids that architects have established, but according to the signs that tell us where to go 
and what to buy. This is what architects need to look at. Everything I've been talking about in terms of the problems that, that architecture has, I think can very simply be summed up by this image, which is that architects don't know what to do with this image, and this is where architecture should be located. The central problem that we must confront in the world of architecture is the world of sprawl. The physical world of sprawl that is the translation into the human-made world, which is the proper arena for the skills, knowledge, and discipline of architecture, of the dissolution of power structures, of social structures, of family structures, of even the self, into these nodal arrangements that are defined by the continual movement of people, information, and goods, and that are completely controlled by forces outside of our control, outside of our knowledge. It is up to architects to use their particular knowledge, their skills, the history that architects know, to look carefully at this. Now this happens to be, I think, a very beautiful image taken by a very good photographer. And I also love it because it was taken about three blocks away from where I lived for many years in Los Angeles on one of those impossibly sunny days when you can actually see the mountains behind Los Angeles and there are very few cars on the road, probably seven o'clock in the morning on a Sunday morning. And if you look at this image, you notice that not only do the signs dominate, but that there is a relationship between the signs and what counts for buildings, between the yellow of the Porsche, the orange yellow of the Porsche, and the orange yellow of part of the building and the orange yellow of the MasterCard sign, that there is a relationship of rectangles and of posts and of orders that move throughout this image that architects need to understand, need to know, need to be able to figure out what to do with. This is the issue. And it is the issue because if architects don't do something about it, this is how it's controlled, through Big Brother everywhere at all times watching us. And the reality of the world of sprawl is utter and complete and deadening banality. Banality that is deadening in a social sense. Banality that is deadening in a sustainable sense. It is using up our unrenewable resources at an unbelievably alarming rate. And it is a banality that is deadening in a visual sense. And in this set of images by Joel Sternfeld, it's literally deadening because these are photographs of places where murders actually took place. And we also, of course, know that it is a lie that that human-made world presents us with a set of images, completed forms, that are in fact no more than chemical combinations that are actually just a complete fiction that allow us to lead our lives. If it is true that our world is sprawling, if it is true that our world actually consists of that continual motion, and if it's true that the way in which it operates is invisible to us, so miniaturized, etherized, and abstracted that we can't see it, then dive into it. Go to the code level. Get organic with zeros and ones. It is very easy to imagine that one way to attack the world of sprawl is to go to the sprawling reality that lives inside the commuter and to imagine that we can lift up out of the endless combinations of zeros and ones and of codes new forms that escape by their very nature from the logic and from the constrictions and from the banality of the world around us. Even though, strangely enough, the more we use these forms, the more they begin to look like just a deformation of existing shapes and forms. And even though, when we propose them, they turn out to be impossible monuments that are monuments nonetheless. Perhaps, we can follow the logic of code and begin to think that what it really 
should lead us towards is a rethinking of the very human body, of nature around us, in fact, of the distinction between the natural and the human made. That we might indeed, as the early theorists of computer-based architecture have argued, begin to think of architecture as being post-humanist. I think a contradiction in terms, but perhaps as no more and no less than a collection of data. This is the most radical architecture. This is the way, if you want to keep making buildings, to push it towards complete information. And Patrick Schumacher has, in fact, proclaimed that parametricism is the style of the century. I don't know, have you had him here yet? Not yet. Not yet. All right, you have to have Patrick, the, the, yeah, the, the, the grand priest of parametricism, come tell you that you are all evil and failed unless you follow him to the promised land of parametricism, which will save us all because it is a style. If you want to make something stylum, go parametric. However, that's not how most buildings are made. What interests me is whether we can delve into not the fictions of architectural form, whether we cannot look for yet another Eden beyond what is built, but whether we can investigate and interrogate what is built and what does work. And I call what gets built and what works W modernism. I could have called it Zara modernism, any number of things, but W modernism, after the W hotels, is almost at the end of the alphabet. We're almost at the end of times. And it is the most banal architecture you can imagine. Is there a W hotel in Toronto? There must be. I bet you it's one of the ugliest buildings in town. It is a clunky bit of modernism wherever it is. But at the heart of it is this. One of the most perfectly engineered ways to be at home in a modern world. If you can afford it, if you're at a certain socioeconomic level, you can buy into a way to be completely modern, plugged into all kinds of technology, floating in the world, moving around, in control of your destiny, the actor in the stage you wish to be on, and be completely comfortable, be swaddled, be cocooned, find a way to be completely at home in this world, and don't dismiss this kind of design. This design has been perfected through decades of getting it so that when you wake up in the middle of the night, you know exactly where your glass of water is and where the light switch is, and so that your body never has any aches or pains when you stay in what they call their heavenly bed. Actually, I think that's Weston. Theirs is a wonderful bed. Everything else would be a W. But it has this sense that everything just dissolves and everything is completely okay. And of course, if you have somewhat less money, you can buy it at Zara. You can buy the uniform that makes you part of this modern world. And these environments are engineered, strangely enough, to look like what the grand masters of modern architecture thought our modern world was going to become. Minimalist, completely reduced, as white as possible, and as absolutely functional and logical as you can imagine. And I think that architects, some of the architects that interest me, are pushing this. And they're saying, OK, we're not going to kill architecture and go into code. What we're going to do is go and find the skeleton of architecture and unearth it. We're going to find within that value engineering, that reduction of architectural form to what absolutely works and what is worth the investment, we are going to find within it a kernel, something that we might call architecture, something that we can stretch, something that we can deform, something that might allow us to understand where and perhaps even who we are. And this is a wonderful project by a collective of Belgian architects and designers and artists.
for the Venice Biennale, where they simply went into hundreds of people's homes and looked at how they took what architects had given them and subverted it and made it their own. How they took all of the messy things that the architect had spread around and converted it into a monumental form. How they planted plants, how they broke windows and doors where they weren't supposed to be that where they weren't supposed to be there. And then these architects took all those moves and abstracted them, turned them into the correct architectural version of the subversion of built form. And at the same Biennale, another group of architects looked at the uh, German prime minister or president's house in Bonn that is now abandoned as a perfect emblem of a reductivist and yet very luxurious architecture that stands for power but turns into nothing but a series of sliding planes that dissolve the mass all around them. And other artists have thought, in fact, of architecture as consisting that which, of that which makes change, that which alters environment, that which organizes our perception, finding it in this case in the luxiflex shades going up and down, continually opening and closing. The Belgians seem to be onto something. This was the Biennale before this, where a group called Rodor asked the question, well, if we want to talk about our human-made environment and about the great achievement of architecture in terms of creating an alternate to the natural world, a human-made environment, then what is the essence of what we have achieved? It's not the great monuments by Mies van der Rohe and Le Corbusier and all the other dead white males. The essence of the making of the human environment is in artificial materials. It's in all the stuff all around us, which is not really stone or wood. It's composite. It's a chemical recombination of things. So they took pieces of linoleum and cast stone and other artificial materials out of buildings everywhere and put them up as pictures, as art, for us to look at so that we could see what we have made. And of course, the beauty is that when you do that, when you look carefully enough, when you interrogate what is already out there, what you can find, what you can hunt and gather, you find the marks of human beings, the place where they have become worn down, the things that we have done to make this artificial world our own. It is by doing almost nothing, not by building almost nothing, but by finding almost nothing or leaving something almost completely empty that you can begin to find what might make us at home. In other words, architects are beginning to get very good at raising the dead, at evoking ghosts, at finding the specter or the veil that shrouds our reality that we almost never see, that we take for granted, and building that veil, that very artifice, that very thing that you can't quite put your finger on that is the result of our technological acumen, that is the reflection of our banality, that when you abstract it out, takes on a presence of its own. They are beginning to lead us through the maze that is our sprawl until we come at that one moment where we confront ourselves, where we see ourselves in the world that we have made all around us where the world dissolves into those beeps and bleeps, those dots that are the matrix-like reality of our world. Doug Aitken, very skillful uh, video artist, has been fantastic about collecting and collecting all of the images and forms and stories of sprawl and putting them together, and he did what I think is one of the most beautiful pieces of architecture of the last 10 years, 
because he took one of the worst pieces of architecture of the post-war era, this pillbox of a bunker imposed on what's supposed to be an open space dedicated to democracy with the name of a private individual who gained the money by raping mountains all over South America, filling it with art that doesn't fit there, and posing it in this concrete, deadening, maddening nothingness. Doug Aitken projected all around this building this haunting, ghost-like story of people always looking for love, looking for each other, always remembering each other, this melody played all around you of loss and memory, sung by everyone from Tilda Swinton to the guy next door. And people would sit and tailgate and watch this movie unfold with candles completely covering it and songs lighting up the night eye. Here was an architecture that brought all of the complexity of sprawl together. But it doesn't have to be that either abstract or that expensive. We now have, and of course, as always, artists are about 20 years ahead of the architects. We might now have 20 to 30 years of artists saying, the way you reinvigorate space, the way you create social connection, the way you make us aware of the world we live in is not to necessarily make a picture or a sculpture of it, but maybe just to hold a good dinner like Rick Wittiranue did and invite some people over to have a good conversation, to create a state set in which we can all act. That the way you activate public space is to fill it with umbrellas, to create moments of shade and collective space. The way you attack the unseen power of the Kremlin is to restage a courtyard in the middle of the Hermitage. That the activity in Shenzhen confronting this huge plaza that is supposed to represent government powder, uh, power is to fill it with traffic cones done by the same guy who did the memorial to the World Trade Center the lights that get turned on every year and that are so much better than the total shit they put up instead of it. Sorry, excuse my language. Um, and these cones both represent uh, the continual building and movement of Shenzhen where they're always creating new roads, but they also become this mobile way of creating space that you yourself can move around and change. And of course, you can be even simpler than, than that, like Ai Weiwei was when he just gave the finger to the mother of all those big Chinese spaces, Tiananmen Square. Architects, in other words, need to learn how to manipulate not necessarily empty lots into built form, but to rethink and reimagine what we already have, to be able to see or re-see or rethink a reality that we thought we knew, to begin to manipulate and combine the world all around us. We've now had 20 years of Rhino and Revit, and for those of you that are patriotic, um, oh shoot, now I've forgotten the name. What came before Silicon Graphy, the great Canadian company that started it all was called? Someone remember? What's that? No. No, no, it was bought up by Silicon Graphic. They were the first people who did all of the architectural fly-throughs. Soft Image. Soft thank you. We've had 20 years of Rhino and Revit and all these things, and architects still haven't learned that the most powerful tool in their toolbox is Photoshop, is the ability <laughs> to collect what is around you, not to invent things that are more and more tortured, to rethink and manipulate the world around you, and these are student projects at SciArc, by the way, to recombine existing forms into something that might not look quite familiar and yet is, and I saw the word on the blackboard upstairs, uncannily familiar, or unheimlich, to use the German, that has a sense that it is a reawakening of the potential, the ghost inherent in the building, teased out 
and used to create a better world in a social and environmental sense. That architecture is an artifice, is a stage set that should be producing the kinds of worlds in which we can act the role we would like to act, and we would like to make our own with those who we would like to be our fellow actors. That architecture is nothing more than a reimagination of our world. And this, I think, is, is one of my favorite buildings, other than the Doug Aitken video uh, created in the last few years, because it is pure image. Vinnie Maas was asked to come back to the village in which he grew up, a place called Schendel, in the middle of nowhere in the Netherlands, if you can have a middle of nowhere, and build essentially a mini mall in the heart of town. The way he handled that was to go around with a very good photographer and take hundreds of photographs of all of the farm buildings around Schendel because they wanted an architecture that would evoke the tradition of the agricultural buildings of Schendel. So he took hundreds of photographs and then they combine them all into the uber farm, farm building, the ideal farm building. You have the Ionic, the Doric, the Corinthian, the Composite, and then you have the Schendel farm building, the perfect farm building. And they built it at 140 degrees because you, 140 uh, percent bigger because you know monuments have to be bigger, but they built it by printing it on glass. So it's not really there. It is purely an image, a ghost, a veil. It has no presence, and yet, and yet it is imminently real. It brings everything around it together into this completely banal, run-of-the-mill program, and then hovers in such a way that you are never quite sure whether it is there or not, or what, in fact, it is. At the edges, of the construction of built form is this notion of an architecture of a restaging, a rethinking, an appropriation, a stealing, a scene setting, a problematization of the basic social relationships that we never otherwise question. If buildings wind up imprisoning us, if they wind up repeating the codes, then find a way to break the code. Find a way to offer alternate relationships. Find a way to tell other stories. And these are images by the duo Elm Green and Dragset, who create these incredible scenes, that, of which one of the largest was this one where you would walk in through this tunnel, be accosted, asked for money, offered sex and drugs, and never night knowing what, it, what of it was real. You would find this apartment building in the middle of it with scenes from everyday life, including this poor kid lying on his bed, all depressed with his guitar and Gay Romeo playing. And uh, he, at one point, he had more followers on Gay Romeo than any other uh, person in Europe, even though he didn't exist. And all of these scenarios played out before you. This is not a beautiful architecture. This is not even an architecture that you can inhabit. But it offers an alternative. It holds up a mirror. It maps out alternate scenarios for the world around us. It is perhaps even playful. It sets our world in motion in a completely different way in the manner that Chris Burden did in this project in the Los Angeles <coughs> County Museum of Art. It is a way of reusing what we already have. And I would argue that these kind of enscenements or setting of new scenes are no more or no less than the radical destiny towards which an architecture of reuse and rethinking is now tending. Because we have, it has become now very clear to us that we have to think of architecture as reuse and rethinking. In fact, when they make me dictator, one of the things that I would argue is that architects should be forbidden from making new buildings unless they can prove that there is absolutely no other way to house the institution or the individual or the corporation that needs it. 
Architects should first ask the question when someone comes to them, you say you want a building, not how many square feet you want, what's your budget, but why do you need a building? Do you really need a building? Could you reuse another building that already exists? Or even beyond that, could you rethink your organization or your life? Is it just a question of living in a different way? You know the number one reason why people hire architects? This was true about 10 years ago in the United States, but I doubt it's changed much. The number one reason why people hire an architect on a residential level is because they're having marital problems. And architecture is a way for them to think through their marital issues. <laughs> and we do the same thing on a social level. We think through our problems, like the redundancy of places of production, and turn them into places of art. Ruhr value the previous one, this one in China. We use architecture as therapy, as a way to reuse and rethink what we already have, to throw an aesthetic screen that is also a screen of consumption, of beauty, over our industrial past, over our solid structures, and turn them into this art project, like Theaster Gates's work in South Chicago. Theaster Gates, someone else you should try to get here, one of the most brilliant architects working today, trained in urban planning in Kansas, then went to work for two years with a master ceramicist in Japan, came back and got a PhD in divinity, and now works as an artist in South Chicago, creating structures by gathering together both building materials and their contents. In this case, in South Chicago, the collection of Ebony Magazine, that is the cultural legacy of the population that still lives in South uh, Chicago, to create the Dorchester Homes, a community center, a place where a jazz band plays every weekend. And Theaster Gates goes around the world working with people and with communities to strip away what is there, to gather what is already present, to work with his uh, Delta Monks uh, blues combine, to sing alive the reality that is all around us. And more and more, we're seeing artists who gather together the discarded materials and forms of the world around us and create structures out of it. Structures that might just be beautiful, but that might also, as in the Heidelberg Project in Detroit, have the function of becoming a stabilizer and even a catalyst for a neighborhood that gather together unused to toys and shoes and just paint a hydrant and stick all kinds of things on a building with no architectural rhyme or reason, except that it brings alive this by now dead area. Architecture should be the gathering together of all of the mass-produced forms and all of the discarded forms that we have all around us. Certainly, the people at Rural Studio, started by Sam Mockby, have understood that for many years now, creating in Hale County these beautiful communal structures out of car windows and tires and sandbags and other leftover lumber. In the Netherlands, the group once called 212 Architects, now called Superuse, I believe, can take leftover kitchen sinks and washing machines and tire tracks, uh, which you're not seeing, uh, and create uh, whole art centers out of it. Or amateur architects in Hangzhou can create buildings out of the debris of other buildings. There they are. My apologies. This is what happens when you change your slides half an hour before a lecture. Um, so there are the tire tracks. Okay, never mind. Um, architecture, in other words, is first and foremost a gathering together, an assemblage or reassemblage of things that we already have. And I didn't put this on just because he's here. Uh, <laughs> but I always, I always show this slide because it is even the reassembly of the ghost of our own body, of our breath, and our chemical and electrical energy, put together to animate 
things that you find in a five and dime store to create a complete and truly organic environment. It's the gathering together of virtual forms into new kinds of spaces. It is perhaps even the gathering of the debris of all the buildings torn down in an island outside of Venice in such a manner that it spills over and fills space. Or, in a perhaps even more radical manner, it is no more than dust that is electrostatically collected around an almost absent ghost of a building in Bangkok by Francois Roche. It's the combination of a Hawaiian shirt, a bus, a building facade, into an unstable form cantilevered beyond what you think is possible. It's perhaps even the gathering together of everything into invisibility. This is one of Sugimoto's, Hiroshi Sugimoto's uh, theater series in which he left his camera on through the whole length of the movie so that all of the complexity of the narratives, all of the forms and images in that movie dissolved into pure white, into that absolute summation, that memory of everything that is now not there, that perfect absence that somehow then makes you aware of the ghost of all the beautiful forms, the dead architecture, the festival architecture that is around these, these screens in these great palaces. Art and architecture as a collage that is a mandala, a way of summing up our world in the work of Julie Meritu, or as Mark Bradford puts it, a map of the neighborhood and the city, Los Angeles, that he inhabits. Bradford goes around collecting handbills, missing dogs, services offered, the signs that tell you the lives in the neighborhood, paste them together on a canvas, puts automobile paint on it, scrapes away at it to find what's left of those signs, put more bills on it, scrapes it away, puts more paint on it, keeps scraping until he has this incredibly dense collage that he thinks of as a map of the world all around it, or the deathless Aphrodite of the spotless mind, this assembly of nothing but leftover materials. Julie Meritu finding the little bits and pieces of the world all around her to create a globe, but also a place, a gathering, a kind of forum where we can sit and discuss and measure our life in coffee cups and in all of the water bottles that we have drunk. Collage art offers the alternative to the notion that art is the reduction of reality to almost nothing, to the same inv invisibility that controls our iPhone. It states instead that art, and I would say architecture, is instead the affirmation of the fullness, of the richness, of all of the possibilities of the world all around it, even in the scraps, in the detritus, in the stuff that you wouldn't take seriously, you can find the echoing beauty that creates these kind of sculptures. The forms that I think could be the building blocks out of which a new kind of world, a better world, could be constructed. It can even be as simple as Pierre Huy proposed, as taking the rubbish bin in a municipal garden, rearranging the various plants and soil, and planting some marijuana plants, and then taking the pavers left over to create a place where you can sit and have a discussion, or hear some poetry, or maybe even talk about architecture. It's about marking the land, and in that marking, making us aware in this project outside of Venice of such issues as global warning with a grand gesture that is no more than a mark. And of course, this is something that we know by now because our best public spaces have become these spaces of reuse, where we become aware again of the city, of the environment, of the place that we have all made 
all around us. Marking rather than making. Reuse rather than making it new. Finding a way to find your way in the world around you and to make yourself at home. Not replacing nature, but letting nature go. Letting nature perhaps even take over completely. One of the best public spaces in the city that has produced the best public spaces of the last 30 years is this new park in Barcelona, where instead of building the kind of grand monumental plazas that made them famous in the 1980s and 90s, they took this promontory that had been used as a place for anti-aircraft guns that was always meant to be a park, but that was taken over by people creating homes on it. And then rather than creating a grand new park, they merely took away only those things that obstructed use and views and left everything else. They created paths through this environment in order that you could have the freedom of the city and the sense of a social connection. Many, many years ago when I first met Frank Gehry, he was working on the temporary contemporary the temporary home of the Los Angeles uh, Museum of Contemporary Art. And he pulled me aside, and I thought this was very special until I found out later he did this with everyone. But he pulled me aside and he said, don't tell anyone, I'm not doing anything. And in fact, he wasn't. All he was doing was following those codes to create an environment that was safe, that wouldn't stand, fall down, that wouldn't burn, and leave it at that, not doing anything and thereby evoking the place. The same people who are responsible for that are creating a school in which architecture is allied to urban agriculture. And that, in turn, is allied to urban planning in an attempt to create a self-sustaining environment in an old farm building. The essence of some of the best modern architecture is about letting go, about revealing what is already there, about merely just marking some space so that kids can play a game in the middle of the harbor. It's about imagining how we could reuse those emblems of banality, those places of corporate power, those palaces of consumption, those monuments to mobility that are airport, turning them into slaughterhouses and places of memory and reality. With my own students, and you always have to show some of your own student work or you're not a good teacher, I have been working for a few semesters now on thinking how you could reuse existing buildings to do everything from plant mushrooms to create swimming pools inside of old churches and make parks out of our derelict neighborhoods. How you could reimagine an old supermarket as a place to play basketball and to have a fresh food market as well, as well as a place of art. How our monuments could be eaten out by the revelation of an otherwise invisible technology. How architecture could be a way of stealing, and this is the hardest part. I've only gotten one student to do this. I always learned that the first lesson in architecture is, if you like it, steal it. And I think we don't do nearly enough of it. I had one student who merely took a plan of a McKean Mead and White building, stole it, stole the Cristo wrapped in, uh, wrapping, and then stole the idea of a feral environment from another artist, and created this disco-like art center, which was a place for feral cats, an assembly of the architecture that was already made, a reusing of what already exists, or carrying out in a different material. This was the porcelain model that my students made, six by eight feet of a whole section of Cincinnati. Above all else, architecture, I hope that I've been able to show you, is about not building, but unbuilding, not about stating, but opening up. Not about creating form, but revealing form. Not about building, 
but gathering together. It's about cutting through those things that keep us apart and opening up new possibilities. It is a kind of cloud, something that almost doesn't exist, that makes technology visible, that represents what isn't there, that is almost impossible. The true elements of architecture, as Rem Kohlhaas very rightly pointed out at this year's Biennale, are in fact those pieces that hide from our sight, that allow us to live in our artificial cocoons. It is up to us to scrape away at those lies, to reveal what is there, to find the hidden and dirty stories that happen in our anonymous public spaces, to give lie to the grandeur and flagellation of contemporary architecture by pulling it apart, reusing it, and rethinking it, by destabilizing the relationship between what we think of as background or frame and what we know to be built form and object. It is a question of figuring out how you can gather what you already know and have to make yourself at home in the modern world. Jasper Johns and Robert Rauschenberg knew it when Robert Rauschenberg took the bed that they inhabited together, splattered with a paint of their making, and turned it into a work of art that now hangs in the Museum of Modern Art. Frank Gehry knew it when he threw the color core from mica on the ground, found in it the fish scales that reminded him of the moments as a kid when his grandmother would bring home a carp and put it in the bathroom where he could play with it and see all of its beauty before inevitably it was taken away and killed and turned into gefilte fish. A beauty that haunted him because of the guilt of his pleasure at eating it. And at the same time, that fish for him was the emblem of a kind of architecture he wanted to make. Not a grand building, but a kind of useless form that he said also recalled the slippery and smelly reality of the fish. It's gathering all we know into this one drawing that draws out what otherwise is invisible. This is a student project in London for a gentleman's club in which the whole project finally resolves into the drawing of the hand of the last remaining member as he opens the doorknob into a now no longer existing building. Architecture in this manner is a catalyst. It is not the built form, but it is that which makes us aware of the built form. And to me, this is perhaps the final way to think of an architecture beyond building, an architecture of hunting and gathering, as that which somehow, in some way, makes us aware of where we are, restages, resets the world all around us. We live in this crazy quilt environment that might, in fact, be tending towards complete disillusion. We might, in fact, be nearing the end of times. We are certainly destroying our world. We are committing social injustices by our very existence every day, all day long. How can, as art has done, architecture draw out and do something within that environment? Certainly, there are tactics, and they are no more than that. And the recent exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art, uh, Uneven Growth, began to bring out and bring together some of the tactics that two of the participants, Hubert uh, Klumpner and Alfredo Bellenberg, and I hope to be able to bring to the Shenzhen Biennale. And I invite you all to come and participate in that Biennale uh, opening on December 4th, where it's not just a question of making buildings, but perhaps a catalog of building elements that people could acquire, a reimagination of the various bits and pieces of Hong Kong turned into artifacts floating in the bay in front of it, 
or in a very concrete sense in NLE's project, a reuse of existing forms and technology to create a school, but also a whole floating world, a reimagination of what a truly poor sprawl could look like. I therefore don't want you to get the idea that I am proposing not architecture. I am proposing architecture as a way of making a difference, a visual difference, a difference by its very gathering, a difference by its revelation, and sometimes, even in the work of urban think tank, a very concrete difference, a difference that allows people to reuse in some of the poorest neighborhoods, uh, townships in South Africa, the buildings, materials that they've already collected to create better dwellings, better ways to be at home in the modern world. I'm sure many of you know the work that they're doing in Torre David, where they are helping the people who had taken over a 40-story skyscraper that was left unfinished and turned it into a community. If you don't know about it from architecture, you might know it from Homeland, the series, and begun to wonder how they could, through the very portrayal of these people, through their participation in their lives, begin to create a better world for them. This is not architecture that says we're going to put handrails up. This is not architecture that figures out how to make the building up to code. This is an architecture that starts and maybe even stops by photographing it, by documenting it. And I think that the architecture that excites me is sometimes the architecture that just makes us aware of what we already have. This is one of my favorite websites of all time. It's called ontheroofs.com. It's two crazy Russian kids who go to the top of tall buildings all over mainly Asia and Middle East and photograph themselves, sort of the ultimate selfie right before you die. <laughs> and there's an exhilaration to this. Because let's not forget that we are all still in architecture. Even if you're not making more skyscrapers like this, even if you are unbuilding, even if you are hunting and gathering it, you are doing it because you love what we have made as human beings. Because there is an exhilaration to the history of architecture and the history of built form that has led to this crazy ass environment and to us perching on it and figuring out what it is that we can do with this world. So I'm going to go off to the desert and to one of the worst examples of sprawl in the world and figure out how I can work with the tradition of someone who was one of the few architects who actually said we need to do something about sprawl. We need to not turn our back on it like most architects have done. We need to figure out how to be at home in a modern world of continual motion. We need to figure out how to make places of beauty and celebration that break the box, that open up, that might be inherently unstable. We need to spiral away from what we already know. We need to make something that comes out of the tradition of rebuilding our world as we know it, bit by bit. So I'm going off to Taliesin to try to figure out whether somehow we can reassemble the traditions, the forms, the building blocks of architecture into something better, into something more sustainable, into something open and sustainably just, and into something more beautiful. That's what I'm going to be doing. If any of you want to join me, I welcome you in Taliesin. And I hope that all of you can go out there and make a better architecture. Thank you. <laughs>